This is the Dart Mesquite Patrol presentation on calling the helicopter. As we do scenarios, we always talk about the helicopter as one of the resources we can call for. And the helicopter offers a few advantages over a ground ambulance that may be of benefit to a critical patient. Our helicopter, talking specifically about DART, generally comes with a crew of a pilot, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse. And that team offers some additional capabilities over the ground ambulance. Number one, they can give blood or blood products to patients in hypovolemic shock. They can do minor surgical procedures, including chest tubes for tension pneumothorax, and they can do RSI, which is they can anesthetize, paralyze, and place a breathing tube in a patient with a head injury. The biggest selling point of the helicopter, of course, is the rapid transport. If everything goes smoothly, the ground ambulance from Hanover Fire will probably arrive at the skiway first, so we can load the patient in the back of the ambulance and with the ground paramedics get care started on the patient and move to the landing zone which is in the parking lot by the snowmaking pond and then the hel helicopter will arrive this is because it takes a few minutes to start the helicopter and go through pre-flight checks however once the patient is loaded in the helicopter it's only about a three minute flight back to dhmc versus a 20 to 30 minute ambulance ride so the challenge for us is to identify those patients where that 20 minute difference or those extra medical capabilities will be enough of a benefit to offset the $25,000 bill that they're gonna get and the risk of crashing a zillion dollar helicopter and killing everyone on board. If you're flying around in a helicopter under somewhat risky conditions for a medical flight, you'd better have a darn good reason. So our guidelines at the skiway state that any patroller can put the helicopter on standby, which means we call them and we tell them we might need them. And they go out and they get everything ready, turn the helicopter on, and then they sit there and wait for us to call them back. And it's fine to make that standby request based on your general impression or your primary assessment if you think the patient is severely hurt. And any patroller can request the helicopter to fly but that request must be approved by a patrol supervisor and or area management. We're very fortunate that with very few exceptions, almost every single day at the skiway, we have on duty some very experienced personnel, including paramedics, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse that work for the DART program, an emergency department nurse, a physician, and some very experienced ski patrollers, including area manager Doug Holler, who himself has many years of ski patrol experience. So as a new patroller or a patroller with less experience, before you make that $25,000 decision, it's a good idea to run it by one of those individuals. So before you make that decision to fly the helicopter, you wanna have a full set of vital signs, at least pulse and respiratory rate, if not blood pressure, and you want to know exactly what the indication for the helicopter ride is. Also, we need to know the patient's mental status and weight. This is the New Hampshire EMS protocol for calling the helicopter, and we try to conform to this. So we're looking for the following clinical conditions, any one of which could mean that the patient could benefit from the helicopter. Respiratory compromise or arrest, such as major chest trauma, shock with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, and a pelvic fracture could cause that, neurologic compromise with a GCS less than 13, or the motor component is less than five, which means they're not even able to localize a painful stimulus. If you pinch their hand, they're not able to do anything about it. And that could result from an open or depressed skull fracture, uh, paralysis, spinal cord injuries can be an indication for the helicopter. Penetrating injuries to the head, neck, or torso, so stabs, gunshot wounds, or impaled ski poles, things like that. 
two or more proximal long bone fractures. So if they do both their femurs, that's an indication. One femur by itself is not necessarily an indication unless the patient has something else going on. Mm, destroyed extremity, amputations proximal to the wrist or ankle, so not fingers and toes, or major burns or airway burns. And there's some other stuff on the list. So when this happens and you make your radio call and you think you need the helicopter to fly, you need to be able to explain to the supervisor or the experienced medical person on duty what the vital signs are and what you believe is the indication that the patient needs the helicopter. And then it's at the discretion of that supervisor or experienced patroller to tell patrol dispatch to either go ahead and make the call or that they will respond and personally assess the patient before making the determination for the helicopter to come off standby and go ahead and fly. It's also possible that when the ground ambulance from Hanover Fire gets there that the paramedic assessing the patient will determine that they can go by ground and cancel the helicopter or the helicopter crew may arrive, look at the patient and decide that they should go by ground. It's also possible that Hanover Fire could request the helicopter without us having done so. And these are just things that can happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that anybody did anything wrong. If it happens, we're gonna take care of the patient first and then figure out what happened after the fact so that we can learn from it. It's important to note, whenever we call the helicopter, we also need the ground ambulance to respond. This is in case the helicopter can't take the patient. They could have a mechanical failure, they could suddenly have a change in weather that means they can't make it back to DHMC, or if the patient goes into cardiac arrest, then it's not appropriate for them to go in a helicopter just because of the difficulty of doing CPR in the limited space inside the aircraft. And what about those weather changes? If it's snowing at the skiway and we don't think the helicopter is going to be able to fly, we should go ahead and make the request anyway as if they could and let the DART pilot make the decision because they have the most up-to-date weather and radar and they can decide whether they can get the helicopter from A to B and back again safely. And Killington or some big ski resort actually got sued for this because they didn't call the helicopter and the patient had a bad outcome even though there was no way the helicopter was going to be able to fly in the weather conditions that they had. All right, that concludes the presentation on the helicopter.